Title uh, does indeed promise communicating systems. Um, the title. <laughs> I'll just leave that there. <laughs> um, don't worry, I am going to get there. Um, what I really want to talk about, though, is uh, total functional programming, and that, that should probably have been the title. Um, so I'll tell you. I'll tell you more about what I mean by that as we go. Um, so Idris is. Uh, a purely functional language. It has dependent types. So uh, if you were all at the keynote this morning, you'll have, you'll have learned about some of the cool things you can do in languages with dependent types, and particularly this idea of, um, uh, of type-driven development, the, the idea of coming up with the type first, and then because we've, we've, made that, uh, we've made that promise of, or we've made that plan of what we're going to work on, we can have the machine help us work towards a working program. So the goal here, and the goal behind, the, the, the goal for you know, me and the way, the way I want to write programs and the way, the way my research is going, is I want, I want it to be so cheap to write correct software that there's no excuse for not doing so. So um, now I think we're quite a long way from that, but, uh, but th this, th this, this approach of um, dependent types, type-driven development, and working towards a program from the specification, I think it's a highly promising approach uh, to, uh, to doing that. So uh, in this talk, uh, I'm particularly going to talk about the importance of writing total functions and how writing total functions helps us have a lot more uh, confidence that the functions we're writing, the programs we're writing, do exactly what we expect them to do. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something we, that we don't often talk about, um, at least in, in this kind of community, is that um, uh, sometimes uh, you, you hear people say, or sometimes I hear people say anyway, that uh, uh, if, you have, if you have a total programming language, you can't write a server, some people think. This is, this is, I, I, I hope to show you that this is, this is not true. So total functional programming is about a lot more than merely checking the program terminate. It, it's about uh, having complete confidence that the types we write um, really are describing the programs we're writing. And the practical example that hopefully I'll get to, I, I like the fact that Jessica used the word hopefully in her introduction there. Uh, I hope we're going to get there too. So we'll, 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 see how, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so what do I mean by type-driven development? We've already, we've already seen this this morning, in fact. So think of the type as being a plan. Don't think of the type as being you know, the thing that you tell to the compiler, uh, and then you write your program that goes alongside that type. And then you feed all of this information to the compiler, and the compiler, the, you know, the, the teacher, will send it back to you and say, you know, you got it wrong. You know, eight out of ten, see me after class. Uh, you know, redo it. And so you resubmit your homework, and eventually, hopefully, you get it right. We should be thinking of the types as being kind of like our assistant, our, our lab assistant that will um, get us to that, pro or help us get to that program. So just like you saw with, uh, with Agda's program uh, search uh, machinery this morning, that's the kind of way we'd like to work. So we'll write the types first. We'll define programs interactively. Programs might contain holes. So holes stand for uh, parts of a program that you haven't written yet, um, but you intend to write at some stage. So again, we saw a lot of examples of that this morning. So Connor was writing these um, uh, almost complete programs, but with holes that, uh, where, where, he, where, where he was saying to the machine, you do this. This is boring. You, you do that job. Um, so and as, we, as we work through a program, eventually we'll end up at a, a complete um, a complete implementation. And uh, what, one thing we didn't hear so much about, but certainly happens, is when we come up with a type, we don't get that type right first time necessarily. So this process of, of developing um, a program, uh, we might learn a little bit more about the problem, so we have to tweak our types a little bit. Um, and eventually, by this sort of back and forth, or this iterative process of write a type, define the program, refine the type in the program, hopefully we'll end up at something that's going to work. So uh, I was informed, so as Jessica very, very helpfully mentioned that, uh, that there is a book on Idris coming out soon. And uh, the editor uh, insisted on me having a three-word pithy phrase to summarize this process, because I don't know anything about marketing, and he told me that this is what you have to do. So if, if, you're, if you're into test-driven development, you'll know all about red, green, refactor. Uh, well, uh, we came up with, uh, or actually he came up with, uh, type, define, refi. I couldn't come up with this sort of thing. I, 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 I don't know if it's that I've said it so often now that it's starting to sound good, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe it doesn't sound good to you. Anyway, this is what you should remember. Come up with a type, define the function, and then refine the types and implementations as necessary. 
So um, it's kind of like, um, I mean, you, you're, you're um, <laughs> see, when I say that, you, your analogy alarm should be ringing. Uh, there is an analogy coming up. Um, so <laughs> uh, it's kind of like when um, you're doing this sort of thing. So, so this is a jigsaw. You might not be able to see this with the contrast particularly well. So uh, this is a, a pub that's just opened up next to Durham Railway Station, by the way. It's a fantastic pub called The Station House. And, and one thing they have is a communal jigsaw which is the best idea ever in a pub, as far as I'm concerned. But this, this is the communal jigsaw. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, we, we were trying to uh, build a picture of the coronation Scott. So uh, this is, uh, is type-driven development in action, because I can't reach this high, so I'm going to resort to the laser pointer. Um, so maybe you can't see that, actually. I'll use the mouse pointer. Um, so this is, this is the specification that we are aiming to implement. Here's all the holes, and then here's our implementation so far. Now, this analogy does break down very quickly, unfortunately, uh, much, like, much like trains, actually. Um, and uh, it, it, um, it breaks down because this train stays the same the whole time. But let, let's go with it anyway, just, just, just to persist. Now, this, this thing, this what we have here, this, this minimal program, so we'll work through it. We'll, we'll, we'll write a more, few more bits of the program. So here's a programmer uh, working on this program. We've got a few things that we're going to fill in. But this, what we have here, this, this, this image, this is actually well typed. Because uh, all of the bits that we've put in this program, they're there and they work. So if I didn't care about totality, if I was only writing partial programs, I could solve a partial jigsaw and I could say, look, I've finished. I'm done. Get the next jigsaw out. Move on. Let's move on to the next jigsaw. Um, but I can't really do that. A, a, a program is not complete until we've got all the bits in there. So you wouldn't take a specification and say, right, I've done most of this. I haven't dealt with the errors. I haven't dealt with, you know, I've dealt with the happy cases. I haven't dealt with the error cases. But it type checks, so it's fine. So you wouldn't do that. Um, you certainly wouldn't do that. So, so the, the, the fourth road bridge is nearing the end of its life. So this is what we have now. This is, uh, they're currently implementing the specification of the Queen's Ferry Crossing. And uh, you'll see here, they're just, they're just filling in the last hole. So again, you wouldn't be particularly uh, thrilled if they said, well, we've fit the specification so far, and we've got this little bit left over, but you won't, you, you know, you could just drive a bit faster, it'll be fine. So you wouldn't do that. But we, we happily do this in our, in our programs. We happily, we happily run things that, uh, that, that aren't complete, because we think, we think these cases don't necessarily matter. So total functional programming is about writing programs where we know we're going to get an answer. We know we're going to get an answer of the right type. So this, this means one of two things in, in practice. So, um, so these aren't especially formal definitions, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, I think they'll, they'll be fine. So a, a total function is a function which, for all well-typed inputs, it will either terminate with a well-typed result, so with the type we said it was going to have, or, and this is the crucial bit that allows us to write interactive uh, programs, or it will produce a finite and non-empty prefix of some well-typed infinite result. So think streams. So say you're, say, you ha say you're generating an infinite stream, but you only generate the first few things in it, that, that kind of thing. So why do we care? Well, I claim that if we care about types, we should also care about totality. And the reason we should also care about totality is imagine you have some function f of type t. Let's think about what we know if that f is total versus what we know if it's partial. If it's total, we know that whatever happens, it will always give a result of type t. I'm not saying anything about how long it's going to take. It might take a very long time. But when it gets there, it's going to be a result of type t. There's certainly no accidental infinite loop. Uh, has anyone ever written a deliberate infinite loop that didn't produce anything? I mean, I, I hope not. Um, uh, someone's going to tell me perfectly valid reasons for that now. Uh, please save them for later. Um, so. Um, <laughs> I, I know there are perfectly valid reasons. Um, but if it's, if it's partial, on the other hand, then all we know is that um, if it ever does produce a result, then it'll be of type T. And how are we going to find out if it produces that result of type T? We're going to run it. Well, that's not quite what I want. I don't want to know if my, I mean, I kind of do want to know if my program is going to give the right answer afterwards, if I know that it's got the right answer. But I kind of I like to know up front if it's going to produce the right answer. So. Um, I didn't, I, I've called this T, and, and um, someone uh, remarked over lunch that uh, we functional programmers like to give single letter uh, variable names to things, and it doesn't help anybody. There is a reason I picked T here rather than, say, type, and the reason is that T could also stand for theorem. So um, 
This is so, sort of part of what I mean about making it easier to write programs where we know they're correct. Thanks to Curry Howard, if you have a type, that type is also a theorem that you might be proving. And then your implementation of that program, your implementation of f, is your proof of that theorem. So uh, I'll show you some examples of, of what I mean by this for, for writing total functions uh, in Idris. Hopefully, this is kind of also by way of an introduction to the syntax if you haven't seen it before, uh, and to help you with what's going on later on. So let's, um, so I have, a, I have a, a, an atom buffer here. I like to use atom rather than vim or emacs when I give talks, because uh, if, uh, if you pick vim, everybody looks at your talk and thinks, oh, I liked your talk, but it's a shame I have to use vim, because for some reason, people think that if you use vim, everybody has to use vim. So, so um, I'm using atom here, because that way I can alienate an entire audience rather than just half of it. So there you go. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't actually use Atom in practice. So, so there, there, are, there are Idris interactive modes for Vim and Emacs and Atom. So all of this stuff I'm doing in Atom, uh, you can do in, um, in a text editor as well. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I really, really shouldn't say that sort of thing. <laughs> um, right. I'm going to be in so much trouble when this goes on the internet. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Um, right. Um, so, uh, is that okay for font size? It was when I checked earlier, so yeah, you're okay, good. So, vectors you've seen, um, you've seen this morning, so it, it's the same sort of idea, the lists indexed by length. Um, and just, just to show uh, the basic idea behind, behind this uh, type-driven approach in Idris. So, I've got zip width. Zip width is a function that's got two vectors side by side. Uh, the two, it's kind of like two sides of a zip and you pull the zip up, pull things together, and we happen to apply a function while we're pulling those things together. So we're applying a function correspondingly to elements of the vector. If I was using Angular, I'd be able to do this, this in one key press, and I'm jealous of that, and I will get around to implementing it eventually. But what I'm doing is I'm doing a case split on, on each of the possible inputs to this function. Idris is telling me what the possibilities are. So notice, in particular, if I, the two, the two inputs are the same length, so if I do a case split on the second thing, after doing a case split on the first thing, it had better be the same length. So in this case, better be the same length. And because this thing I'm searching for here, so this, this query zip with RHS3, this is a whole. So uh, it is, uh, it is a, just a part of the language. I can type check it. So I, if, if I ask the machine what its type is, it'll give me uh, all of the context. It'll give me the thing we're looking for. And then I can search for um, what goes in there. Right. So that's... Uh, that's your basic uh, zip width. And something that Idris always does that I don't often you know, put up front is Idris always checks whether function definitions are total. So I could load this into, into the REPL and ask Idris if zip width is total. Oh, the only one I care about is, is this one I've just written, main.zip width. So main.zip width is the one I just wrote, and it says it's total. If I do something daft like, um, I don't know, miss a case out, um, then it says, it's not total as there are missing cases. So um, you might think, well, why is, that, why is that just something that's in the REPL rather than something that is really an error? And the answer to that is um, it's simply about path to adoption because programmers don't typically think about, I mean, you do think about these things informally, but you don't think about explaining them to the machine. Um, whereas I think long term, it's going to be, uh, I mean, uh, David Turner, who I'm pleased to see is sitting in the front row, wrote a lovely paper in uh, the 1990s about this, that we, what we should really be doing is thinking up front about making sure our programs are total rather than, you know, anything else. So, um, so um, if we all get used to this, if we all get into the habit of, of checking our programs are total, then I can change the default to, to make Idris report this is an error. Um, so you can, uh, uh, oh no, I should put that back in. You can have this be an error. So, so I, if I put a flag on a function that says, I want this function to be total, then, um, uh, then I can make it an error. So that's a, uh, and I would actually advocate if, if, you're, if you are doing some programming in Idris, so you, you, could, you can make this a default by putting a pragma at the top of the file it really is a good way of catching mistakes in your thinking. So if you write a function where the machine doesn't believe it's total, you should think twice. Now, you might be right, because obviously we can't, there is no solution to the halting problem, so the machine can't decide for certain. The machine might be wrong. 
why you'll notice it when you see the error shortly, it, it says possibly not total because it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily convinced. But uh, you, might, you, you, can, you can give it extra evidence and you can even assert it if you think you know better than the machine. But it's, it's, it's generally a sign that you should rethink your definition and you might have accidentally introduced some infinite loop somewhere. So um, just to really drive home why totality cares, I've got, I've got I've quite, why well, I care about totality and why it's really important. I've got um, a type here, a function that I, where I'm going to try to implement, I'm going to try to produce a value in the empty type. So void is the empty type. If I can produce, uh, if I can write a function uh, of type void and, it's, and Idris thinks it's total, then we found a bug in Idris. This is, this is the rules. Because, um, I mean, what kind of thing, if, if you know... If you know something void, if you know, if you have a proof of the empty type, you can basically do anything from that point. So how, I mean, just to, just to show how you might go about making one of these things and get, get Idris, have Idris, um, you know, allow it, you could say something like, um, well, let's, let's do it, let's, let's do it this way. So if I say, you know, empty equals empty, so just some kind of meaningless statement that, you know, a thing, a thing is a thing but I claim it's uh, empty. It says, well, empty is possibly not total because it, it, it's aware that this is trying to solve the halting problem here. Um, so, you know, it's just some kind of empty statement where a thing equals a thing. We're not going to make any progress on that one. I mean, it's kind of like... Uh... <laughs> you know, some kind of meaningless empty statement like that. And it's... Uh... So if I say... Um, uh, if I try to claim it's total, then it says... Uh, well, Brexit is possibly not total, so we kind of knew that already. Um, right, so let's move on. Uh, so um, that termination <laughs> alienated the other half of the audience now. <laughs> uh, that, so that's termination. What about productivity? Because we're going to need productivity before we get onto this um, uh, this this um, uh, communication. This is, this is going to be crucial. So what if we try uh, counting from, so building a stream of numbers, counting from some number upwards. So let's try to add a definition. And um, okay, so if I'm trying to count from k, then I can, I'm, I'm, I'll stick a k on the front of the stream, and then I will make more stream. So this is a, a counting from k plus one. So this is, this is building a stream uh, rather than consuming a stream. So it, it's productive. We have, a, we have a k that we're gluing onto the front. So um, I'll just keep making these uh, uh, while, uh, while I want them. So um, let's try reloading that. And uh, oh, it's broken. Brexit's broken everything. <laughs> Um, let's, yeah, let's, let's just not do that. Uh, you know, I woke up this morning and I told myself I was not going to do that gag. I was absolutely not going to do that gag. So, good job I listened to myself. Uh, right, so uh, we can reload it now. And, no, we can't. Uh, yes, we can. So, we've got um, count from. If I try running count from uh, 10... Then it will say. So this is this is the the, the interesting thing that's happened. Rather than producing a, a, an infinite stream, it's produced a thing, and then it says, "Well, when when you ask me for it, but not yet, I will start counting from 11." So this this delay says that um, you know I I'll, I'll I I want to produce more of the stream, but I've already produced the finite prefix, and that's all you've asked me for. So I'll produce more later on. And how do, I, how do I get more of that stream is the question. This is the crucial question for certainly when you're running interactive programs. And the answer is I have to provide some, some, kind, of, some kind of fuel to drive this computation. Um, is this your analogy, Connor, the fuel-driven thing? I think, I think, I think Connor is, uh, is the one to thank for calling this fuel-driven. Um, so we're trying to, we're trying to produce some... Um, uh, 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 we're trying to work through this stream and get some things out of the stream. So we have to provide some fuel that allows us to uh, uh, generate these things. So the fuel comes in the form of a natural number. So I'm if I'm trying to get the first k things out of a stream, then, well, what are, what are the first zero things in a stream? It's an empty list. And what are the first successor of k things in a stream? Well, it's the first value and then the first k things in the rest of the stream. So let's reload that. And if I now try saying, let's, let's take the first five things from a stream where we count from 10. And this time, it's, it's because I've asked for them, because I've provided the fuel, then that delay has been forced. So we've got more stuff. So um, what I haven't shown you is whether that's total. 
and it is total. The reason it's total is because we're producing a finite non-zero prefix of the stream. So uh, Idris is happy to do this because it knows, because it's, producing, because it's guaranteed to produce that prefix in all cases, it knows that when that fuel eventually does show up, it will be able to make progress. Okay, so what does this all have to do with concurrency and interaction? Uh, well, uh, way Idris checks for total, just, just to, the, just to you know, hammer that home, Idris is checking coverage, so we saw that with zip width. I took out the empty list cases and it said no. Checking for termination, so this is again in the zip width case, the recursive call was on the smaller thing, and in the empty type case, it was something that didn't have a decreasing argument. And it, checks, uh, it, uh, it also checks whether something is productive. So if, if, um, if, if these uh, coverage in either termination or productivity hold, then you have a total function. So what I'd like to do, uh, I'll do a commercial break first. So, so this, uh, <laughs> this is, the, the reason I do this is there, is there is a discount code for this conference, valid, valid only during this conference, I believe. So you can get 39% off this thing. And, and, and it, is, it is going into production next week, by, by, which basically means the desktop publishers get their hands on it. So you, 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 can, you can have it soon. So uh, just to put that up now to get you thinking. And all of this stuff I'm presenting, it's, uh, it's basically in here. So, uh, right. So what about interactive programs? Um, like Haskell, so if you know Haskell, you'll have written programs with I.O. So just like Haskell, Idris works with an I.O. type. And I like to think of I.O. as being uh, a description of interactive programs. Well, to be honest, the reason I like to think of it that way is because that's just what it is. I.O. IO is a type which describes interactions. The only way we can have those interactions happen, run, uh, is, uh, is by having a runtime system get its hands on it. So the runtime system will, will take this description of actions and it will you know, actually do stuff talking to the operating system. Um, so simple example here, the hello example, what's your name, print the name, I'll read the name, print the name. So when we execute that, when we tell the runtime system to execute that, that's what will happen. Trouble is, uh, interactive programs, um, uh, usually run, if not forever, at least you, know, you might have some kind of loop. So here's a, here's a loopy interactive program that does the same thing, but then it does it over and over again. So this is an interactive program that we want to run indefinitely. And um, it doesn't, unfortunately, satisfy any of those um, conditions that, that, that I talked about before. It doesn't, it doesn't satisfy this, uh, uh, there's a decreasing argument uh, condition. Um, so, um, an I.O. is specifically the type of, of, of terminating I.O. action. So if I try to do something non-terminating, then that's not, that's not, uh, well, not going to be total. So I want to find a way of describing interactive programs uh, in, in such a way that we can get them past the totality checker. And the trick, um, which I think might be due to Peter Hancock, possibly. Is this, is this a Hancock trick? Or is this a Tomo trick? I'm not sure. Connor, Connor will know. So the trick is to describe your interactive programs as, um, it's not, I, I call it a stream. It's not really a stream. But it's, it's, it's kind of a sequence of interactive actions. So an interactive program, an infinite interactive program, is a program with an action that terminates, so an interactive action, followed by, given that result, I will tell you what more interact, uh, uh, infinite actions you need to produce. And then we can give that do, no, do notation by, you know, you'll notice that this isn't particularly close to the signature for, uh, you know, binding in a monad, but we can, we can give it do notation by uh, defining, overloading this function. So if I try writing that, um, what's it complaining about? Oh, right. Yes, okay. Um, so if I try writing that program, uh, try, there we are, there's, there's our InfIO type, and there, then here is, a, here is our loopy program in, uh, in InfIO, and I will load that into Idris. And check whether loopy is total, and it says, it says now loopy is total. The reason being that we have, we have a prefix. We now have a non-zero finite prefix of stuff to do before we make the recursive call. The only unfortunate thing is we're gonna have difficulty running this. So we're gonna have to explain to the machine how to get around to running this, uh, this uh, uh, program. 
So one simple way to do it would be to define a run function. So we, we have a pro, so just like with IO, IO programs, when we execute them, we're kind of explaining to, uh, the, the runtime system is getting hold of this program and then doing stuff. So we could do something like say, okay, let's, let's take this interactive program and turn it into IO. The problem is the, 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 the thing that runs it is gonna have to be partial because there's, be, there's gonna be some recursion going on here. Um, but I'm not entirely satisfied with that because I, I, want, I want as few things as possible to be partial. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take this uh, fuel analogy uh, too far, and we'll we'll add a f we'll 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 add a fuel argument to our to our run function. So I could say right, I'll, I'll provide some fuel, which is basically saying this is how long I am I am willing for this uh, infinite process to run for. So I can do run, and I'll I'll, I'll make a tank of ten things, um, and so this is this is going to run for. 10 IO actions, um, which unfortunately is not very long. It's run out of fuel. Um, <clears throat> so the final thing that we do uh, is, well, you know, if only, we, if only we had some kind of solar power or some kind of renewable energy to, uh, to, to, to keep this going, we could, you know, if we, if we could generate a number that was just big enough for, for what we're going to need, uh, and what, what we do is we have this one, one partial function at the end called forever, which will generate fuel as we need it. So if I say uh, run forever, loopy, and then... Um, I, I, I chose Fred, Jim, and Sheila as uh, some people might recognize this, as a, as a homage to the previous speaker, Sophie Wilson. Uh, Fred, Jim, and Sheila were um, uh, hardware maps, memory locations on the BBC Micro. So, um, so, so yes. But I, I mean, I can. Uh, Joe, who and Robert? Mike. I don't know him. <laughs> oh no, I, I'm afraid I haven't. Oh, okay. Um, right. So. Um, you get the general idea. We, we can now write interactive programs to possibly run forever. Uh, Idris is convinced that, uh, that the loop is total. It's happy that the run function is total. The only thing is we have to, we have to provide some kind of you know, constant fuel to the runtime system. So we do, need, we do need one bit of partiality, but it's just about the runtime system. And you always need a runtime system. There is, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing that's getting you out of you know, Even if your program is pure, you run a pure program at the REPL, well, you do see an answer there. How do you think you see an answer? Something external is doing it. So you have that external thing of you know, a bit of fuel, and then, and then you're good to go. So just to um, finally bring this to the communication, because that's what I promised. Um, so we've seen this. Um, so the Idris runtime system supports a kind of message passing concurrency, so, so inspired by uh, Erlang. And, um, uh, so there's various things implemented on top of this. So, so what I'll show you is a, a simple thing implemented on top of this. Um, so it, it, this is, I mean, it, it's kind of, if you types for concurrent programming is, is, a, is a huge space. So certainly going back to uh, Kohei Honda's work on session types in, uh, in the 1990s and, and growing out of that. So there's a lot of work in this space. What I'm going to show you is, is massively simplified from that. Uh, it, it's probably, well, it certainly is an instance of the kind of thing you can do with session types. But what I want to show you is just something that... Um, it's, it's a way of writing simple but remarkably common patterns of concurrent programming by putting a little bit more in the types. So what happens? Uh, a process can spawn a process. Um, a process can make a channel, and it can make a channel either by connecting to another process or listening for connections from another process. Once you have the channel, that's a bidirectional thing that you can send messages back and forth on. So the kind of thing you might do would be, would be this. You might have... Um, uh, a process uh, main, and main has maybe spawned an adder, and um, uh, main will send adder a message saying, I want to add two numbers, and then adder will send a reply. So you might, you might imagine a, a system that's, that's spawning a lot of concurrent uh, uh, processes which are willing to respond to messages on interfaces. Uh, to be honest, it's exactly like object-oriented programming, sending messages to something that responds to an interface. What's wrong with that? Um, so we've got some uh, messages being sent and messages coming back. In fact, the name messages, is, it, it, it sort of suggests it really is object-oriented here. Um, so 
how will we go about doing that? Um, well, what I'd, what I'd like to be sure of is, is when I send that ad, uh, the thing that comes back from the adder process is going to be an integer, or a nat in this case. Uh, I don't want it to send back just any old rubbish. I don't want it to send back just a string. I want it to send back something of the right type. But these things are two separate processes. And if you have lots and lots of processes, how do you know that they're interacting in the way that they're supposed to? So as well as talking about the, um, uh, the, the, the types that you send as arguments to functions and the types that, that come back, you also have to think about what the protocol is. So not only what you send, but when you send it. And this is something that uh, types in programming languages have not typically been particularly good at expressing. It's, 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 uh, uh, but you see this sort of thing all the time, doing things in the right order, doing things on resources at the right time. So, so you know, you, if, if, if you're writing a network server, you, you, you create a socket, you bind that socket to an address, you listen for connections on that socket. And you've got to do these in the right order, and the socket's in a different state at every time. Uh, what's the type of a socket, though? Int. Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> But it's in a different state at every point. So this is the kind of the thing that's going on here. It's, uh, we, we, have, we have a process that's in a different state at each point. So somehow we want to be able to encode that using the type system. So because um, I've only got a few minutes left, I'll, I'll just show you the program. And um, possibly by showing you the program, I, I, I'd hopefully convince you that, that, that you could have written this program. So um, I'll start by defining an interface for the, the concurrent uh, communication. So I've just got one kind of request. I can add two numbers. And from the request, uh, I'll write a function which calculates the response type to that request. So these, these things together, this request and response structure, says what's coming back based on the, the value that's being set. And to define a server, notice that a server has to be total, because there's, no there's no point in having a server that runs forever if all it does while it's running forever is, is just you know, nothing. Uh, and there's no point in having a server if that server is going to crash at some point. So this, we want the server to always respond to the messages that it's getting. So I'm saying it has to be total. And it is a server loop, and it has to, re and it has to work uh, using this response interface. So it has to do a couple of things. It has to, uh, while it's running, it has to accept some incoming messages. And once it's done, it has to loop. If I miss out, I've, I've carefully set up the types so that if I don't do either of these things, I mean, I, I can do other stuff too. You know, I can, I can, I can stick in um, a command saying, or a message saying, I'm waiting. So there's, there's, no, there's no requirement that, um, uh, that, that I, I do exactly these things. But at some point during this process, I have to respond to a message. Uh, and then the client, uh, it's got a reference to that server, and it sends it a message. So the fact that the interface is in the type um, and the fact that I've, I've encoded the, the protocol in the type means that if I get this wrong, my program's not going to type check. So I'm, I've, I've, I've encoded that communication pattern in the types, essentially. And um, where does totality come into this? Well, this is this adder program. It's, it's, it's an infinite sequence of actions. It's going to, this, this sequence of actions is going to go on forever, but it is always going to do something before, before it moves on. So let's, um, uh, let's just load that. I have to turn the color off because the contrast isn't great here. But, um, OK, so let's, uh, oh, the, yeah, so what, uh, I'll show you the main program as well. So what the main program does is it spawns the adder. By the way, this, this notation, so it, it spawns an adder, and, and if it succeeds, it gives me a reference to the server. And um, this is if it fails. So this is um, it's a pattern matching bind, as you might have seen in Haskell. Um, but this is, this is the alternative cases. Uh, if I miss this alternative case out, it's not going to be total. I haven't dealt with the error. So it's entirely possible when I spawn a process that, um, that it fails. Maybe I'm out of resources. Um, so I have to check that. I'm not going to get past the totality checker if I don't check that. And I really have no business not checking that, because that's an error case that could make my program not behave the way it's supposed to. Um, OK, so it spawns the adder, and then it just uh, runs. And then main has to be partial, because we're using this uh, forever. But we're keeping, we're keeping that forever as, as, as in as, as small a box as we possibly can. So if I execute it, then. It's, it's not particularly exciting. You say I have a prompt, and then eventually I'm going to type in a number, and it's going to send a message and get a response. I've just got this, this in to show you that, it's, uh, that something is going on concurrently. So there we are, 
100 plus 94 is 194. So uh, just to show what could possibly go wrong here, if I, uh, I said that a, a server, if I, I've got a picture. I just happen to have a picture, so I'll show you the picture. Um, so what a server has to do in order to be a valid server is it really has to respond to a request, and then it really has to keep going forever. So a server lives in three states, and if you, if you think back to uh, the index monads we were looking at, uh, you were, you know, learning about this morning, uh, this is actually much simpler because we're in complete control of, of, of the changes here. But um, we start in a state where we haven't received any requests. Um, when we respond to something, I think I called it accept rather than respond. So when we accept something, we move into a state where we have now processed something. So once we've processed something, that's fine. We can loop once we've processed something because we've done something on this iteration. We can carry on responding to more requests, so we can, we can keep responding as long as we like, but we're only ever going to be complete. This program is only ever going to complete if we do that final loop. So the type of, the type of server loop is uh, implementing this state machine, um, and we're making that state machine explicit in the type. So if you start looking, state machines are literally everywhere and yet we don't encode them in the types. These are things about our program that are absolutely crucial. Think of the socket example. It's absolutely crucial to the, the, the operation of the program that you do things in the right order, and yet we don't put them in the types. Why are there things about our programs that we know and we're telling each other, but we don't put them in the types? So this sort of thing, you can draw it in just you know, three circles and a few arrows. Let's try to put it in the type. Um, so what happens if I do that wrong? Like, so let's say I don't bother looping. Um, it says, type mismatch between sent and complete. Um, that means uh, you're supposed to be in the complete state, but you're actually in the sent state. Um, or uh, if, I, if I don't bother responding to a request. And it says, uh, type mismatch between sent and no request. Well, I can't loop. I'm supposed to be in, uh, oh, so the, yeah, I'm, 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 in the, I'm in the no request state. I'm supposed to be in the send state. So um, this doesn't work either. So um, this actually comes back to a point this morning about error messages as well. So I mean, these error messages, I mean, the, the main problem with these error messages is, is that they're long. Uh, but you do, see, you do see explicitly what the problem is, that there is a mismatch between uh, the state we're in and the state we want to be in. But the point Connor made about we don't have type error messages, I think is an important one. Because when I wrote this program, I didn't write this program in one go. I didn't just write this out and hope that it would work. Um, I did something a bit like this. Uh, I, uh, I, I said, well, I've, I've got most of the program, and then I've got a hole for the rest of the program. So um, it says this hole tells me something really useful about the, the, the rest of the program that I have to write. It says, you are writing it, so it's, uh, it's normalized to type. Uh, this, this server loop is a, a type synonym, so a uh, type level function. So it says, I'm doing something that the process is something that, that gives a response. And you're currently, or the, the process is currently in the state sent, and somehow I have to get into the state complete. So by this type driven approach of, of you know, where have I got to, where do I have to go, um, I'm not going to get that kind of type error that I just showed you because I followed this whole driven approach of, of writing bits of the program as necessary. So just, uh, you know, hammer that home a bit more. What happens if I don't do the accept? Well, I'm, I'm now in no request and I have to get to complete. So the types are telling me the state transitions that I have to do uh, in order to, to make some progress here. Right, so, um, and I guess. Uh, yeah, so I've got a, well, I'll make it about a minute or so. So um, I'll, I'll just show you what the definition of process is. Um, and, uh, well, <laughs> I, I'll, without, I'll, I'll present it without comment, and then I'll comment. So, um, so we've got, um, I, I've got a definition of the states that a concurrent process can be in. Um, and then I've got the process type. So the process type says, I have an interface, the operation has a result, and then there's an input state and an output state. I think that's, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to put in a type. They're things, they're things that we know about this uh, operation, so let's put it in the type. 
And then the, the, the operations that you'll see are that, uh, you know, I can, I can send a message to some server with a particular interface uh, as long as I'm using the right interface. So this is, this is the return type. It's, it's going to be a response on that interface. And I can send things at any point. It doesn't matter what state I'm in as a server because uh, I'm not doing any server activities here, just anything. Uh, or if I, 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 I can accept something um, provided that the, th the thing I'm working with is in a state where it hasn't received yet, and that moves me into the uh, send state. So I can accept something at any time. Uh, the important thing is when I accept it, I move into the send state. Um, so uh, I can loop. That moves me from the send state to the complete state. So all of these operations, it's, it's just like the types you'd see for any kind of operation. It's just that we've got these additional two arguments of, of, of the state we're currently in and the state we're moving to. So that particular function, or that particular type, by the way, it went through, I think, about four or five iterations before I hit this point where, where it was doing the right thing. So you know, the, the, the question of, you've got to get the types right. Well, you've got to get them right, but once you have the types right for some library, which you can then give out to users, you don't have to get it right again. People can then take the benefits of this type that you've, uh, you've, you've, you've sweated over. OK, so I've talked about all of this. So uh, just to finish off, um, all of these ideas I'm presenting uh, were invented by other people. And there are, there are things you can read about, uh, about these things. So um, one I would, I would highly recommend, this one, I've listed them in order of, of um, something. I don't know. Uh, so, uh, certainly, I uh, intend to put this one first, because I'm really, it, it, the message of this paper about strong functional programming is that uh, writing total functions should be the norm, not the exception. And, and I think this deserves a lot more attention. It, it, it's a very accessible paper if you're familiar uh, with the functional programming language. So I would highly recommend you, you take a look at it. Uh, and just to say that a lot of people have been thinking a lot more than I have about writing uh, interactive programs using a dependently typed language and still getting the benefits of totality and still getting the benefits of, of reasoning about what those programs do. Um, I've just you know, taken some of these ideas and tried to implement them. So these, these, these papers, I think, are well worth a look if you're interested in, in where the ideas I'm talking about have come from. OK, so um, I think I will stop there. Uh, I will uh, thank you very much for your attention and um, finish with a bit of just grotesque marketing, because why not? OK, thank you very much. <laughs>Do you have three minutes for questions? Okay. Um, many questions, um, <laughs> but just one. A couple of days, it's fine. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, in your communication uh, between your different uh, processes, yeah. um, you didn't need to use the infinite fuel of tank for that one. Oh, I did actually. Um, sorry, I, I, did, I should have drawn attention to that. Um, so, my it, question. It's, it's here. Okay. My, my question is, in, um, in these active processes, I don't understand why you need the infinite tank, because you are producing an output. You, you, are, you are sending a, a response. Yeah, but the server's going forever. So the, the server is, um, it, it is, is an infinite sequence of server actions. So that server keeps doing stuff. Yes. So when I, when I loop, I'm saying... There is now a server. There, there is now a new server that's also going to run forever after this thing I've just done. Okay, um, I'll I'll come to talk to you afterwards because I'm still confused. <laughs> yes. In in uh, one of your slides, you showed an example of an interactive waiting loop um, of sorts. And then you added a number, a final number into it and produced a, a this sum. This would be, was it this one? Uh, no, um, I think I said the word waiting, I think. But oh, maybe oh, it was yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was this one. Presumably. Yes. yes. Uh, how did you get it to go so slowly? How did it? Oh, right, that's a really good question. And, and um, I, I should, when I did the colon exec and the, and the loop and the waiting, so the, the, the first pause was because it was compiling the thing. The second pause in this accept is the particular implementation of accepts I'm using has a deliberate one-second block, because otherwise, 
uh, that wouldn't have worked as a particularly good demonstration. So I should, have, I should have said that explicitly because you're now probably all thinking, wow, Idris is incredibly slow. Uh, no, I, did, I did put in a one second pause deliberately. Um, um, yeah, I mean, a, a, a real concurrency library would allow you to talk about these things, would allow you to say, oh, I, I want this to block for a long time or I want this to just go if there's no messages. Uh, uh, how far off do you think Idris or something similar is from being practical for use in industry rather than academia? Is it ready now? Please uh, say yes. If you're willing to have a go, uh, I'm willing to help. You have to get your hands dirty. So the, the, there are a couple of things that are a bit awkward. Uh, so the, the runtime system needs some work, but there's some fantastic work being done by Stephen Dolan on this malfunction system, which is basically taking the OCaml back end and making it accessible to other language implementers. So, so uh, I'd certainly like to get my hands on that at some point, at which point we'll have a good runtime system. Um, and I think that there's, we need to do some work on efficiency of the type checker. Um, so it, it, it's, it's OK, it's usable, but it should be a lot better. So um, it's a question of how willing you are to put up with those two things. Um, so there's, there's a bit of engineering work needs to go into it. Um, OK. We have Oh, yes. Time's I don't know which desktop it's on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We only have a five minute break to get to the next session. So. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. There we go. So we can leave this up for <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, Edward. Okay, thank you.